Hello all, welcome to the show. I'm Gus Gagliardi and this is Fire Code Tech. On Fire Code Tech, we interview fire protection professionals from all different careers and backgrounds in order to provide insight and a resource for those in the field. My goal is to help you become a more informed fire protection professional. Fire Code Tech has interviews with engineers and researchers, fire marshals, and insurance professionals, and highlights topics like codes and standards, engineering systems, professional development, and trending topics in the industry. So if you're someone who wants to know more about fire protection or the fascinating stories of those who are in the field, you're in the right place. Welcome to Episode 2 of Fire Code Tech. Today we have Ruggiero Lavreo, but he goes by Reno for short. Reno is a lecturer at Massey University in New Zealand. He has a PhD in civil engineering with an emphasis in human behavior in fire and egress modeling. On episode two of Fire Code Tech, we get into what it means to be a researcher and the researching process. Also, we talk about being published in a scholarly journal and what it takes to be a part of this collaborative process. Reno has been published in more than 20 scholarly articles. Reno's research takes him to the intersection of new technology and fire protection. Some of the technology Reno uses for the advancement of his research is virtual reality, augmented reality, and machine learning. We talk about what it means to BIM model and some other really fascinating simulation programs. Don't forget to follow Fire Code Tech on social media and subscribe so you never miss an episode. Let's get started with the show. Well, hello, Reno. What's going on today? Thank you for inviting me. Everything's good from DC. We have a wonderful day here. That's awesome. So what are you doing in DC? I know that you're a professor at the Massey University College. I am here visiting NIST, the special fire division, because I work with them on research focusing on wildfire. This research is uh, led here by Dr. Erika Kuligowski. And yes, my university, Mass University, allowed me to, to do this visiting. And would like also to thank my, my department, the School of Built Environment, for making this possible. And it has been an exciting uh, adventure in the last two months because we have done so many cool things with the new fresh data from wildfire research. And it's kind of hot topic as you can imagine. Definitely. I uh, I can imagine that it's probably uh, never been a more uh, impactful time to be involved with wildfire research with all of the uh, rampant fires uh, going on um, in Australia. It's been a, a big topic for global news. I imagine that's given a lot of fuel to the uh, proverbial fire uh, the people who are researching and studying about that. No, it's really interesting and we are so excited to publish as soon as possible the funding that we got because we believe that we can do we can give a really great impact on society and that's the exciting part of our research is really applied and can be used quite easily by everyone around the world. That's great. Well, tell me a little bit about your background for the people who don't know. Um, maybe a little bit about your education or your upgrade or upbringing so people can get a little idea about you and about uh, how you got into fire protection. I started studying uh, more than 10 years, university studies uh, more than 10 years ago, or I might say also more than 10 kilograms ago. And... <laughs> <laughs> and I start as a civil engineer. I knew that my soul was an engineering soul. And so I managed to get to university. I was the first in my family to go to university. And a bit by curiosity and by chance, I ended up doing a, a degree in civil engineer, engineering as a undergrad. And then I decided to do also a master, focusing more on structural engineering. But then towards the end of, uh, of the degree, I realized that all the mathematics stuff was cool, but I didn't really want to do that job in my life. And then they had the chance to attend a couple of seminars. One was done by my ex-supervisor, Dr. Enrico Ronchi, that is in Sweden now, Alone University. And he was talking about fire engineering, evacuation modeling. And I was like thinking, that's so cool. So I decided that uh, I asked him if there was any chance to do my master thesis on this topic. And then 
we managed to work together on this topic and then uh, this research became bigger and bigger in terms of my master thesis. I had many other professors involved, Professor Luigi De Loglio from Spain, uh, Professor Dino Bori, Professor Colonna from Polytechnic of Bari. So it was a really exciting time during my master. And when I finished it, I had a big chance to win a scholarship at the, my home university, Polytechnic of Bari. And that was my kicking start officially to do serious research in fire engineering, focusing mainly on uh, evacuation modeling. And since 2012, I've been doing that as part of my life. That's really exciting. That's that's uh, it's interesting to hear you talk about um, how uh, you started out in civil engineering and you know have transitioned into more of a uh, evacuation or fire protection engineering role um, is I just wanted to ask in the U.S. it's it's common it's very common for other in- engineering disciplines to filter into the fire protection engineering field. But uh, usually they go from a discipline like uh, mechanical or uh, maybe sometimes electrical. Only rarely have I uh, seen people come from a civil background. Is that is that more common in other parts of the world? From my experience, uh, there are a lot of people like I'm working in New Zealand and I can tell you I've been talking and meeting with a lot of people. Uh, that work in the field and I can say that there is a lot of people from structural background, civil background that they swap studying on this field. I kind of help quite a lot to spread the news that hey there is also this field among my students because it's a really exciting topic. I must say that in Italy it's reasonable that someone with a civil background start doing something like that but there is also a mixture of uh, people from mechanic engineering, because there is, as you might know, there is a lot of uh, computational fluid or dynamics, and there are a lot of people in mechanic engineering that can give a lot and apply a lot. Intuitively, it kind of makes sense that most engineering disciplines, I mean, if you're in some sort of engineering, you could make your transition into fire protection. And But uh, yeah, I was just kind of interested about that. So you talked a couple of times about research um, will you talk more specifically on some of the some of your interests in research and some of the topics that you are currently in the process of re- researching? Of course, focus of my research is try to understand how people behave during emergency, and I started my research focusing on uh, fire buildings. And uh, something that is really exciting for me is try to understand what are the factors affecting the decision of people to, uh, for instance, to start evacuating, to choose between different evacuation routes and uh, actually make choice about how they move in the space and how they interact with the space. I've been really lucky because I'm playing with this kind of research quite a lot. For me, it's really a game, my work, and I've been trying to make this investigation using a uh, evacuation drills video using uh, uh, new technology like virtual reality technology, augmented reality, in which you can expose people to a simulated emergency and try to understand how they will behave. And it's really exciting because you can do so many variations of the emergency and try to understand why people make such a decision. And I believe that these new technology have a really huge potential for training purposes because you can use the virtual experience to teach people what's the best things to do in case of emergency. And for instance, last year we did a really exciting study showing that uh, doing training with virtual reality, especially for fire extinguishing, is much more strong in terms of retaining information compared with the traditional videos. So we... I'm I'm promoting quite a lot of these new technology because I see a lot of potential from them. That's really neat. Uh, you touched on a, a couple topics there that I'd like to go a little bit more in depth on. But um, yeah, I'd read a couple of your 
um, research articles, and oh, it seems like more than a couple of them talked about uh, pre-evacuation uh, movement or factors contributing to pre-evacuation. So I think that's really interesting in my schooling experience. We had a life safety class, and um, in one of the classes, we had a voice evacuation drill where our teacher would read off a set of instructions and then record how we exited the building by using cardinal directions. And, uh, it was interesting because everybody, you know, took their own um, path out of the building and yeah, I just that's my experience with pre-evacuation and egress modeling a little bit. But yeah, I just wanted you to speak a little bit more maybe on pre-evacuation and some of the factors that are involved with that because I know that you've spent some time there. It's been one of the uh, most exciting part of my research on uh, pre-evacuation uh, study. And I started when I was in Sweden working with my ex-supervisor, Dr. Ronke, and uh, Professor Daniel Nilsson. I say that we are lucky because we have been stealing Daniel Nilsson from Sweden. Now we have it in New Zealand, so it's much easier to do research with him. <laughs> and uh, we we started doing research there because they managed to collect data 20 years ago. And uh, I was really fascinating wow. to have the possibility to work with this data from uh, evacuation drills in a cinema. It's exciting because you can see that uh, the stage is really characterized by uncertainty because people don't have information, they don't have a clue about what is going on. So you see that when they start getting information, this can be done using alarms or uh, through social interaction. They understand that there is something going on. You can see that uh, or they can shift from uh, their normal state, that is the state, before there is an emergency to their pre-evacuation stage in which they try to understand what's going on. Then they make the decision that, okay, it's time to get out of here. And then eventually they prepare themselves and they start to move finally towards the safe exit. At that instant, we can say, this is the end of the pre-evacuation time. And then they start moving towards, the, towards a safe place that can be outside the building or inside the building. It depends on what's the strategy involved. And for me, it was really exciting because we can use a lot of modeling tools, traditional modeling tools to investigate the weight of each factor, social factor, environmental factor on the decision-making process. And just lately, we have been doing a really exciting research using even machine learning. And this is a research that we have started with a wow. uh, dear colleague of mine, Dr. Zile. Zhao from uh, University of Florida, and we try to use the same data set and see how much can we get things better with machine learning, how much can we learn better using this new mining, data mining technology. So it's still an open question for me, and I'm trying to use new technology, new stats, new tools to dig deeper and deeper, and even doing new drills through Massey University I had the possibility to do really amazing evacuation drills in which we had the chance to investigate evacuation, pre-evacuation behavior in our Massey library or many other retirement homes in New Zealand. So it's something that is growing, growing. I just need to find time to sleep less and write more <laughs> about it. <laughs> I hear you. Man, that's exciting. It sounds like you are really into the cutting edge of technology it's you know you've you've hit a lot of uh, big terms and i you know from reading your research a little bit i can tell that you know you're into big data machine learning you know vr ar bim just to transition a little bit you spoke a little bit earlier about virtual reality and augmented reality what kind of applications do those have for egress modeling and you know I, I know you've already talked about a little bit how they are effective in drills and how they um, are really effective modeling uh, techniques but yeah will you speak a little bit more on you know what is VR and AR perfect no virtual reality the difference virtual reality is when we have a complete immersion in a digital world 
we can have a not immersive virtual reality, and that's what we display on a screen. Basically, when you play any video game, we have experience of non-immersive virtual reality. Instead, when we put those fancy goggles and we get part of the game, we are immersed in the game, we have the so-called immersive virtual reality. Instead, augmented reality is the visualization of digital content in the real space. And the easiest way to explain that is to think about holograms around us. One of the easiest examples is Pokemon Go, in which we have Pokemon bouncing around our room. Or even the reversing camera of your car, if you think it's a perfect example of uh, augmented reality, because generally you have the visualization of digital lines that help you to make your own decision. So it's a technology that has been there for a while. And it's really interesting to use this technology for evacuation grass because we can use virtual reality to test different things. We can, for instance, test if the evacuation signs we put in a building actually are perceived by people and well understood by people and then eventually fulfill their purpose. So we can make a lot of investigation to find out which combination of evacuation signs are the best to guide people in a building. We can use uh, virtual reality also to investigate human behavior, try to understand how people make decisions, how they get out a building or from a tunnel. Even more, we can use virtual reality to train people so we can give them a package in which is they try a software a simulation which they try to use an evacuation system like a fire extinguisher and they learn through the process by doing mistakes and I can tell you that this information they get really stuck on the mind of, uh, of the people that do the training. So there is a lot of potential like potentiality for virtual reality. It's also good to let people that don't know anything about evacuation to be part of the evacuation and show simulation of what will happen if there is an emergency in a building. So you can emerge them in the emergency and show them the results of an evacuation simulation run with a computer. Augmented reality is pretty much helping in the same way can be used basically in all the fields. And uh, we have been doing a bit of literature review about what has been done so far. This is a work that I've done with a colleague, Max Kinateder from uh, the center I C N R R. I don't remember the name of the government organization of Canada for research, sorry. <laughs> and uh, we have been uh, doing research, a literature review, and try to understand uh, what are the applications of augmented reality for evacuation uh, purposes. And this research hopefully is going to be out soon, showing all the potential of this new emerging technology. That's really interesting. Yeah, I, I've definitely thought of Pokemon Go as augmented reality and some other games as augmented reality, but I've never thought of, you know, the lines on your backup camera. I guess that is augmented reality. Those lines are not physical. It's just a projection onto, you know, what is actually there. Yeah, so I think that's a, a key a factor. And, you know, we're talking about VR and AR, you know, virtual realities that a full computer, full digital experience, and that augmented reality is kind of that pseudo full digital, you know, you're one foot in the virtual world and one foot out. So I think that's really interesting. And I definitely see a lot of promise in that area. And, you know, in the next 10 years, I can only imagine what we're going to be able to do with that technology. It's, it's in its infancy for sure. Um, so that's really interesting. I wanted you to speak for just a moment on BIM, BIM content, or, you know, I see that uh, one of your classes that you've taught, or maybe that you're still teaching, is a BIM class at Massey University. Could you just speak a little bit on uh, BIM and and your stance on BIM and what BIM is and that sort of thing? Uh, BIM stands for Building Information Modeling. And if you Google it, there are many definitions about what is BIM and uh, if it's a process, if it's a 3D model. So in a short terms, uh, in a short definition, I can say that BIM is a database 
building database with all the information that you can have about that building, so not just about the information about what's the number of doors, what's the furniture that you get in that, or many beams, but also the information about when those elements will get in place and what's the cost of those elements and what's the life uh, time of these elements in the building. Those will, all this information there are connected with a visual the model that allow you to investigate from a 3D point of view all this information. But people talk also about BIM in terms of a pro process because if you start sharing information in such a, a new way, you can uh, modify all the way we run uh, uh, construction uh, work in terms of programming, in terms of uh, uh, cost estimation. And that's why I'm teaching this topic in, uh, in our degree at Mass University in construction, because it's a key tool that can make a big difference in, uh, in the process of uh, construction. Simplify things, reducing, uh, clash that, uh, reducing clashes, reducing uh, error, reducing redoing, and so killing the costs and improving the quality of the built environments. Definitely, I totally agree with you. Uh, yeah, my uh, I've had my experience with BIM is that it's excellent for coordination. You know, I have I have experience with Revit, which is a it's a big uh, BIM tool, and yeah, I like what you said about you know it's not just that it's a door, but it's more information about the door. How much does it cost? You know, what is the maintenance items with the door? You know coordinating the door with the architectural features, all of these pieces that play into each other. BIM is not just, you know, the door or the light switch or the wall. It's all of the things that connect with that. The potential is great because also for management of the building in terms of facility management, the build information model that then we kind of swap the name in a set information model is a key set of information if we want to maintain the building and if we want to make a change in the future of the building and even at some point when we want to demolish the building we can have enough information to do those processes in a really effective way the important things the central is to maintain the beam maintain the information whenever there is a change in the real building we need to make this change also in in our data set we start in fact calling we are so if we push this so much, we can call it digital twin. And we can start using this digital twin to do a lot of accurate assessment about what is going to happen. I see what you're saying. Yeah. And that's a constant struggle with the building owner um, is keeping the model up to date. You know, oftentimes you'll get a set of drawings from a building that was constructed, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 you know, 80 years ago, and the as-built drawings are from the initial construction, and, you know, you don't have reliable information about what the existing state of the building is, so that updating the building uh, model and just having that, I like that, I've never heard that term before, digital twin, I think that's interesting about how you can have a mirror image effectively of a building's contents and how that helps with maintenance and just, yeah, all, th all through the life cycle of the building from the construction to the maintenance to the demolition. That's my goal, beamify the world <laughs> in terms of my teaching. I try to convince my student first and push them to convince their employer that that's the future. I believe it, yeah, it's... It's remarkable that, you know, even in the short span of my career, I've seen the industry, the construction industry lean into BIM and, you know, more 3D coordination. And so I think that that's infinitely interesting and it's the inevitable direction of the field. So I, I think that's great. For somebody that's not um, involved in research or scientific study will you explain like the workflow of research or you know how do you go from an idea of 
a topic all the way into, you know, formulating a research plan and, you know, or, you know, how, how does it, how does it get from step one to, you know, publishing an article? This process is uh, really changed depending on the level of your career. Let's get to the case in which you are a PhD student and you're just a beginner with a research topic. Generally, you have a broad thinking about, I want to investigate the field, and then you start scoping down about what you really want to investigate. And the best way to have an understanding about what is going on and what has been done so far is to do a comprehensive literature review. So generally, this is always one of the first steps in a research, unless you are already an expert in the field, so you know already because you've been reading the last 10 years what is has been done. So if you're a beginning, that's the best way. Read, read, read. Try to understand what has been done. Try to understand what has been the advantage of new approaches, disadvantage of these new things, and try to identify the so-called research gap. That means that there are spaces in which we don't really know what is going on. We don't really have answer. Or we know in certain condition. So we, we want to understand much more in, about that. And whenever you are capable to identify the research gap, that's the starting point to build your work. And uh, most of the time we try to bring light, collecting new data or developing new experiment that give us the information that we want and then do a bit of analysis about the data we collect and finally provide an answer. That's the exciting part. Then for me, the boring part is to write down what you have done. <laughs> and probably <laughs> this is a bit the tedious part for many of my students to write down. They are really scared of writing reports or journal articles. Because it's if you think, explaining in a really clean and a simple way what you have done to everyone else. Seems easy, but it's not that easy. In fact, writing the first draft, it might take even a couple of weeks, three weeks, a full month. And then uh, you ask uh, all the collaborators to read it. You see that among all the people that have been involved already in the research, they read it and they start saying, uh, you know, I don't really understand what you're trying to say here. So it's really exciting to see that writing is really challenging. But of course, then you get used to it and you start getting better and better. But uh, when you are a PhD student, I might say that in my case, it was the biggest struggle. And I must acknowledge the help of my ex-supervisor that were nice enough to help me <laughs> improving and not killing me after reading my first draft. <laughs> yeah, I guess it makes sense. You know, you have all this process and this research and you find, you know, oh, here's the conclusion. And then you have to take this large abstract, you know, cutting edge technology idea or conclusion and you have to distill it down to, you know, the salient points or, you know, the, you know, the real meat of it. And so I'm sure that's as much of an art as finding out the topic to research or providing, you know, a meaningful conclusion is being able to convey that idea in a way that is effective, you know, I've never thought about that. And this is just halfway because once you have a piece of paper that is written, it's still not real science in the sense that you need to try to publish it and that's can become really challenge because you need to submit it and go through a peer review process i know that you've been published a bunch of times it looks like you've been published you know uh what was that it looks like you have in terms of journal paper almost 30 journal papers I wanted you to talk about uh, a little bit on what it is like to submit a scholarly article to a journal paper. And yeah, what, is, what does that look like? Because I, I really have no idea working in the commercial fire protection um, you know, 
what that looks like? So the process is uh, it's, uh, that you try to get the best that you can get in terms of shape of your manuscript, not just in terms of writing, but also figure that are really good in terms of resolution, in terms of what they explain, in terms of a research process that you have done or results. And also in terms of wording, making sure that there is no typo. I um, must confess that I'm one of the worst typo makers in the history. So you have to make sure that the text is not perfect, but almost there. And then you submit it to a journal that you believe where the article might fit. And there are a lot of tools from Elsevier, Springer that help you to select what's the best journal. Another way to identify the best journal is to see which article you've been citing quite a lot, which from which journal they are from, and probably that means that this journal is kind of a carry on on a research topic that has been really important for that journal. So once you select the journal, then you need to write a nice uh, cover letter explaining to the editor in chief why this new piece of research mattered, why you want to submit it to that journal. So explain the rationale behind and uh, submit it. And then what happens is that uh, either the editor-in-chief or the associate editor is the one that read, scan this journal, try to understand what he's talking about, if the quality is good enough for a journal publication. And after that, he decides to assign this, if he passes all the checks, you know, uh, he decided to send uh, this uh, journal for peer review, at least a couple, two, three external reviewer that are generally academic people or people from the industry that are really expert on that topic and ask them to go through the paper and advise in terms of uh, quality of, the, of this piece of research. And this process is generally blind with the reviewer and uh, it can be also double blind in, 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 the, in the terms that the reviewer doesn't know who has written the, the article. And the work of the reviewer is to read all the paper and try to understand if it's acceptable for publication, if it requires minor change, or if it requires major change, or if it's not suitable enough for many different reasons to the journal and that provide the information to reject. And then the editor is the one moderating, try to understand what's the best decision to take using the advice of those reviewer and make the final decision. So if the editor decides to review, to go forward with the review process, he submit all the comments received by the reviewers to the authors. They try to address it, they send it back to the journal. The editor send it to the reviewer. The reviewer try to understand what have been the change and they provide again another decision. So this process can go in a loop hopefully for two, no more than two or three times. And until the time the decision has been made. And there are some process, and I have an example in which I had a journal paper under review for two years. Wow. Or others that instead they were under review for just three, four months. It really depends on what's the situation of the review process. So my advice for all the researchers to be patient and appreciate all the work of the reviewer and the editors because it's all voluntary job. No one is paying for you. I'm working as an editor and as an editorial board for several journals in the fire engineering, safety science, fire technology, and fire safety, and the fire safety journal. And I can say that all this work is done by for free. So everyone needs to be patient and be respectful of the work done by others. That's really interesting. I, I did not know anything about that. That's, that's super fascinating to hear you talk about just the process of 
selecting the journal. I, you know, I didn't think about the fact that, you know, you have to be selective about what journal you're submitting to. And it's a process of, like you were saying, finding out the references and, you know, uh, going back and forth on uh, what journal might be interested in the type of work you're doing. And I found that really uh, interesting. And I'd never imagined that it would be such a collaborative process, uh, back and forth, if you will. I, in my mind, as somebody who's uninformed, I would have imagined it was, here's my work. You know, if you like it, you put it in the journal. If not, you know, uh, you don't put it in the journal, but it's, man, it sounds like it's a, it's a huge collaborative, a collaborative process. And, um, it's really more of a back and forth, a tennis match of, you know, uh, making this work together. It can be also a frustrating game <laughs> match. <laughs> and, uh, especially if you are at the beginning, you don't really know the system and, uh, and I can remember the first review process in which I was reading it and say, okay, I'll close my computer and try to read it in a week because now I'm too pissed off with everything that I got. I can imagine that. I mean, I, I can imagine being impatient waiting for a month, let alone for years. I can't, I would just be, man, I would think that would be really difficult to, but I, but I like what you said about respecting the editor and that they're doing that of their own volition and on their own time and you know they're doing it for free so you have to have a underlying respect for the editor and for the journal itself so i thought that was a, a wise thing to say so that's interesting really cool um man that was great. What does an average day look like for somebody who is a teacher and a researcher and somebody who also edits for uh, scholarly journals? What is what does your day look like? Take me through, take me through an average day. My my day at Mass University starts going to office, try to smile to everyone, <laughs> <laughs> and. Because, you know, I'm Italian, so I need to make coffee to everyone. There you that go. This are a coffee. And that's the way to kick in and start the day. And generally, the, the first things that I do at work is check my emails and try not to freak out with the amount of emails that I've received. And uh, because you receive email from students, you receive email from colleagues and uh, other work things and meetings and what. So I try to schedule a bit what's the goal of the day. Mm. Generally, I give all the priority if I receive email from students to answer them. And especially if the, some deadline is approaching. And uh, if it's a day more focused on research and try to do a bit of more research, that can be data analysis, that can be writing or reviewing a, a piece that has been already reviewed by someone else and so try to make the changes that have been suggested. And generally, then I try to have a break for lunch, at least to get a bit of oxygen. Light lunch, bit of salad, try to have a walk to refresh my brain. And the afternoon, I try to keep doing things and I try to slowly start doing something that is lighter for me in terms of less demanding, like the writing is the things that I must do in the morning because my brain is rested enough to do it's such intensive work. In the afternoon, I try to do more soft work that can be for me like uh, doing data analysis, that can be finished reading and answering all the other emails until the moment in which I understand that my brain is off. In that case, it's better to turn everything else off and go home. But it happens quite often that over evening after dinner, I keep reading emails, answering emails, or doing a bit of work, thinking about what can be something to do in the future, stuff like that. I must say that doing, being a researcher and a teacher is not a job, it's a lifestyle. Because even sometimes it's really difficult to switch off, even during the weekends. I imagine that sounds like 
it is a lifestyle, you know, the dealing with the students and the research, and it, I'm sure it's hard to turn that off. That's interesting. It sounds like you're a morning person like me because I front load all my brain heavy work in the morning too because that's when all my best energy is. So I thought that was kind of funny because I definitely feel the same way. Try to get the most grueling task out in the morning. Gym can help as well before going to work. To It's like another shot like coffee to really have the brain super active and capable to do all the extreme work that need to be done. That's good advice. I like that. I like that. So I wanted to kind of get into some uh, professional development questions and, you know, just kind of sounds like you've had some experience in the industry and it sounds like you deal with students frequently and that you have some good advice. So I just wanted to plug your brain a little bit for uh, professionals and young professionals and I heard you give a couple of pieces of advice for students in our interview, but what would you tell somebody getting into the industry for fire protection or for studying uh, fire safety or for researching fire safety? Do you have any piece of advice that you would think about giving somebody like that? It's a really broad topic. So my advice is to find something that makes you passionate about. Because if it's you tackle it like a game, you don't go any longer at work and say, ah, I need to do that simulation there, I need to do that. Try to find something that is really exciting for you. Yeah, money is important, selecting based on what is going to be your salary is important, but it's always good to find something that makes your life interesting, that makes your working experience interesting, because you're going to spend most of your life there in front of the computer, at least 40 hours per week. So it's really important. And there are so many cool things that you can do in uh, in the fire protection fields, from uh, simulation and modeling to that can be applied for fire, uh, fire modeling, that can be applied for evocation modeling or passive protection system or coordination of the project. So there are so many things. And my advice is always to find something that is really make us vibrating inside. That means that it's the right things. And you feel really that you're doing something that you really care. And that makes your life and working experience much better. That's awesome. I like that. Yeah, I think that, you know, one of the best pieces of advice that I got, you know, is, uh, you know, not only is it important to think about, you know, money seems nice, you know, when you're a student, you know, not making very much. But uh, it's important to choose a career where you'll have good mentors and you will enjoy the work that you're doing because like you said yeah. that's your life the working exactly the work environment is perfect things to look at it's not just a matter of salary you need to be happy to collaborate with your people at work to work with them and find the way to get something done and something that can be even cooler done and definitely, and I've heard you say more than one time that you've had some good mentors and good people who are helping you uh, develop. So I think that that's always an important, important thing. So is there anything, is there anything that you wish you would have known before you started down your current career path that you know now, but you didn't know when you started out? Is there anything specific? Oh, it's difficult to say. And uh, generally, I would say before I started doing my research, I wish I knew more math, but <laughs> it's never enough. I can say <laughs> mathematics, be capable to have a mathematics background, statistic backgrounds is always a good thing, at least for what I do. And I believe that also for any person working in the field, in the engineering field, and I keep studying it. I'm not shy to say that I'm always trying to learn new things and try to apply new things. And that's the exciting things about my work. I try to find in the week some time to study new things and try to understand how I can do things better. Be curious is something that is really important for my job. I should say that, uh, no, there wasn't, no, there is not much that I would have preferred to know because I'm happy where I am. And uh, I believe that it was a nice, Path, but nice path 
to reach the place where I am now. I feel similarly to how you feel. You got to kind of just figure it out as you go. And there's no magic bullet for, you know, just figuring it out. One thing that I wanted to ask earlier that I uh, slipped my mind was, uh, so what is the degree program for that you're uh, teaching for? Like what, what degree are students getting when they're in these classes, like your BIM class or your um, egress class, or I don't know if you are construction or VR or AR class? Yeah. And uh, basically, I teach in the undergrad program in construction of construction in uh, at Massey University. It's a three years program that allow us our student to become construction project manager and construction quantity surveyor. And my paper, my course is right at the end of this process in which I show them the potential of this new technology. And uh, all BIM or virtual reality, augmented reality, 3D scanning can be all used to make our life much easier in the construction world. But uh, Messi, we have also a master program with five different uh, major and project management, quantity survey, construction law, facility management, and building technology. And uh, we are planning to open also a new path in uh, G- digital construction, in which, as you can think, just listening to this, uh, this uh, major, there are different specialization for our uh, master students. And it's a really exciting master because we have a lot of uh, students that get in, especially international students that come, they learn about uh, new things, and then they have the possibility to apply it in a really dynamic and exciting uh, working uh, place like Auckland or the full New Zealand. There is so much of demand for our student that it's really challenging to be unemployed with our degrees. Yeah. You really need to work hard not to be employed. Yeah, the fire protection in the United States has a really good rate of employment. Uh, the, the students who come out of my degree plan at Oklahoma State University, they usually come out with a couple of job offers. Um, if you have uh, decent grades and maybe an internship, it's usually pretty easy for, it seems like, fire safety is and fire protection is so young and just kind of the market is starved for these kind of individuals who are um, on the cutting edge of construction and on, you know, involved with fire protection. New Zealand is definitely a nice place to look for a job if you really want to have a life change. It's a beautiful place to work and live. And there is so much demand. So it's something that I really advise to everyone that is thinking to make a move. I never thought about it. It would be interesting for me to think about um, what... uh... Yeah, you can just send me your CV. (laughs) Just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) No, I just was saying, I just wonder about all the differences just culturally, you know, from the U.S., and New Zealand, you know, from the different ways that we work, I'm sure there's more than a couple. But uh, yeah, I have no idea. I'd never been anywhere close to New Zealand, so I don't even have have uh, context for that. I I must say that uh, SFP we have a nice SFP chapter in New Zealand, which is uh, really helpful. We have also uh, to be connected with with the industry. There is also the Fire Protection Association. Uh, We have also the Institute of Fire Engineering. So it's a nice uh, combination of organization and association that help to uh, create networking with with our small. Do you participate in any professional societies? Are you, do you go to meetings or do they have student chapters? I involve quite a lot with the Fire Protection Association, especially with a special group uh, on uh, evacuation and egress, mm. which is led by my my friend and colleague Phil Jackson. Uh, he's one of my main collaborators to run evacuation drills and collect data, especially in uh, retirement homes. 
Hmm. So it's uh, he has been really nice guy to work with because he's the one helping me to be connected with the the real world and not just lock myself out of the real world in my office. And I must say that also SFP has been helping me quite a lot. He gave me a, a small research grant to start doing more research on the retirement homes. So I've been supported by quite a lot of uh, organization and society to do my research and to spread the results of my research. That's awesome. It sounds like you've been uh, gaining a lot of traction uh, with the grants and, you know, it sounds like this new... Um this new work that you're doing with NIST is really exciting. Uh, I saw that you have a talk coming up um, about, uh, oh yeah, it's tomorrow. That's so exciting. What's your, what's your speech about? I'm going to show several application uh, of virtual reality, augmented reality for investigation of human behavior and training. And uh, I'm going to show all the work done in collaboration with so many universities around the world. And, better if I start preparing the slides. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, well, hopefully this can be your practice run for your speech. Yeah, getting your mind wrapped around maybe some questions people will be asking you. <laughs> the presentation will probably be online on my YouTube channel oh, fairly yeah. soon, probably at the end of the week. So feel free to find me on YouTube or on any other social media and contact me. Yeah, what's what's the name of your YouTube channel? Feel free to plug whatever you'd like. It's like uh, my full name and uh, surname, Ruggero Lovredio. It's a really long spelling. I think it's, it's, my name is going to be in the description of this broadcast. Yep. Just copy and paste on YouTube and you will find me. I'm the ugly Italian guy. <laughs> there you go. We'll put your uh, YouTube channel and uh, any other social media links in your show notes, if you like. And that's awesome. I'm glad that we, could, that we could plug something for you and uh, people can find you and watch your talk. I'm sure it'll be very interesting. Yeah, you will find a lot of nice material on my channel. Great. That's awesome. Well, thanks for coming on the podcast, Reno. I can't uh, tell you it's been a pleasure talking with you. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you for inviting Thank you for listening. Be sure to share the episode with a friend if you enjoyed it. Don't forget that fire protection and life safety is serious business. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are by no means a direction or code interpretation. Be sure to contact a licensed professional if you are getting involved with fire protection and or life safety. Thanks again and we'll see you next time. (laughs) 